Hey everybody, this is Matt with Mountain Stream Tees. Today we're gonna to be doing a talk with the title, How to Source Tea. Now, why can I give this talk? Well, I can give this talk because I've been doing it full time for about three years. And I have had some ups and downs and some, some goods and bads, but overall it's been, well, just basically an amazing experience. Now. Let's define terms. So when I'm talking about sourcing tea, what I'm talking about is tea like this that I bought directly from the farmer that will be consumed directly. So that's what I'm talking about sourcing tea. I'm talking about to the end consumer, to the last step. I'm not really talking about sourcing leaves. I'm not really talking about uh, you know how complicated it can get where you would source different grades of tea from different farms put them together blend them go to the the last per what I'm talking about is high quality teas sourced directly for the end consumer for the end product that's what I'm looking for so why don't we get started uh, oh no one more one more last thing so <laughs> before we get started with stuff like this I always have to be very upfront with my own personal biases. I am a hipster tea nerd. I run a hipster tea company. And when I say hipster, what that means is hand-picked, agrochemical-free, multi-generational farm, uh, places that are, uh, you know, that, that hit all those, those, those types of check marks that you're going to get for the same thing when you're getting a high-quality coffees, high-quality wines, high-quality olive oils, all those same things, they all come together sort of in the same spot with uh, hand-picked, uh, not necessarily hand-picked, there are some machine-picked, but mostly hand-picked, multi-generational, small batch, agrochemical-free, family-run farms. And so that's my biases. So as we go through this, you know, if you're looking for how to source, you know, $7 a kilogram teas from the Indian subcontinent or Africa, I'm not your guy. So just just be <laughs> if you're if you're into those types of teas you can turn it off now, uh, but anyways why don't we get started, okay? So why don't we get started? So if you're here and you're here for this type of talk, you might be asking yourself, you know, the question: Should I do it? Should I be a tea sourcer? Should I source teas? And if you want to be a tea sourcer, you know. There's lots of glamorous stories about it. You know, obviously, like just like everything else, it's hard work. But one of the first things you have to remember if you think you really want to be a tea sourcer is that sourcing tea is not a form of, it is gambling. You have to be comfortable with gambling. And when I say gambling, I mean you have to go to a place, you have to find a... A tea, you have to find a tea that you like, you have to fork over money, you have to take possession of that tea, and then you have to be responsible for that tea. You have to sell it. You have to take it to wherever you're going to take it, package it however you're going to package it, and you have to sell that tea. Now, if you are not comfortable with gambling or if you are not comfortable with that amount of risk, then you really do have to think twice about doing this. Uh, business. Now, there's ways you can do it very, very small scale, you know. So when I was first starting out, I was only buying, you know, five, six hundred grams of tea at a time, right, which is which is not a lot of tea, right. So so it was, you know, it was fine. I could do it and uh, and I could, you know, I could have these teas and I could do it for the risk was pretty low to me. But the further you get in, you know, you have to try a tea maybe once, twice, and then you got to gamble. And when I say gamble, you're talking about thousands of dollars. So, you know, that's something you really, really do have to take into consideration. If that's not your personality, if you're not a gambling type of person, then, then perhaps, you know, tea sourcing might not be for you. The second thing you got to remember is, and you see me look down a little bit, I got my, my notes laid here just out of frame, uh, is taste memory and tasting notes. Now, what I mean by that? If you really want to be a tea sourcer and make tea sourcing your uh, make tea sourcing your a priori priority in your life, uh, a career might be too strong a word, but make tea sourcing sort of a priority in your life. You're going to have to be able to remember 
every important tea that you've ever tried and be able to put them together in a way that is... Oh, okay. You're going to have to be able to go to a farm, sample a tea in a stressful environment. Maybe there's people talking, uh, you know, cigarette smoke everywhere, you know, it's just stuff going on. You sample the tea and you say, oh, this year I don't want it. Okay, that's fine. But... You have to remember the next year, when you show up to the same farm, if you go back to the same farm, you're going to have to be able to tell that tea that you tried last year, whether it was the same, better, worse, and if you're going to pull the trigger on it this year. Right? So when you're talking about that taste memory, again, that's the highest level. The lower levels would be, okay, you went somewhere, you got a sample of tea, you tried it, and then they decided, you decided, okay, we're going to pull the trigger on this one. You bought it and they ship it in. And you got to be able to sample that tea and sample the other tea. Sometimes that other tea that you sampled is gone, but that tea that you get into the shop, you got to be able to drink it and be like, okay, that's the same tea. Okay, that's not the same tea. Now, if you're not confident doing that, you're going to have a bad time. Okay, so if you're not, if you're not really confident being able to say to somebody, hey, this is not the same tea, then you're going to have a bad time because you're going to second guess yourself. You're going to be thinking about all those things. Now, is that a, 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 a take it or leave it type of thing? No, of course not, right? You get better at it and worse at it. Uh, I've had situations where I will have sampled a tea, bought in one bunch of tea, and then I want, okay, I want to refill, and then I get another bunch of tea in that tastes slightly different, and I phone them up and go, what the hell? What, what went on? You know, getting a little bit nervous and scared. And them saying, oh, that's slightly different storage. And that slightly different storage was enough for me to pull out the difference in the exact same tea leaves. And actually, when I sat down and calmed down, put the teas side by side, it was okay. It was okay. It really was okay. It was only people like me who are stressed out because I'm gambling on these teas that would have really noticed and cared about the difference in that particular batch of tea to the one before. Now, the tasting notes. That one... is not so important. Now, it's not so important because not everybody will have the imagination to create those, those crazy tasting notes. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know, a, a tire that's been, that's been driven for exactly 125,000 kilometers, uh, you know, and left in the sun for three days. You know, like, no, no, of course not. You don't, you don't, you don't know those, those things. If you don't have that imagination, it's okay. That being said, you got to have the big ones, right? You got to be able to pick out a fruit, right? You got to be able to pick out a, uh, a, the kind of sweetness. Is it a sugar cane sweetness or is it a molasses sweetness? Is it a candy cane sweetness or maybe not candy? Well, Ruby 18 sometimes have a candy cane sweetness, but you know what I mean, right? What type of sweetness is it? What type of sourness is it? If it's a fruit, what type of fruit is it? Now, if you have a problem doing that, then, you know, if you want to be the tea sorcerer, it's okay. You can give it to somebody else who can really go and do that. But if you're sort of a one-man show, if you want to just do it yourself, it's going to be really, really tough if you can't name the fruit, right? So something to think about as well. Also, this one, uh, number three, for me, it's not that big of a deal because I came to tea a little bit later in life. I've only been heavily, heavily into tea for about five or six years now. And, um, and so it wasn't sort of something that, that I absolutely loved forever, but there's a lot of parallels with other things that I have done. If you become a tea sourcer and a serious or professional, or you, you know, that's your job, part of your job is being a tea sourcer, your enjoyment level for tea will drop substantially. Now, what do I mean by that? Right now, if you have some tea, you can think about what you want to drink and how you want to drink it, and you can get a feel for it, and you can keep it at a level that is very sustainably fun and good for you. If you become a tea sourcer, you're going to get in a bunch of samples all the time, and you're going to be sitting there drinking teas that you don't really want to drink. And every once in a while, you're going to be drinking a tea that is terrible, and it's not from choice. So your general enjoyment of the tea will actually drop off. Now, if, if tea is like your thing, it's what keeps, you, keeps the devils away, keeps the dark clouds away, if that's your thing, then you should be a little bit 
careful about taking on the tea sourcing, putting on the tea sourcing hat, right? You should be a little bit careful about it just because perhaps that loss of enjoyment will bite you down the road, okay? Again, for me, it's not that big of a deal. I love tea. Right now, I'm drinking tea for fun. This is, I'll tell you about this tea later if we've got time. But this is, I mean, this is just a beautiful tea. And a tea that, the only reason I got access to this tea was the last tea that I tried when I was visiting a, a partner farm. Well, a new partner farm. Anyway, it's a complicated place, but I can tell you about it later. But the only reason I got access to this tea was because I did everything right, right until the end of the visit. And then he goes, why don't we drink what I drink? <laughs> right? And this is the, the guy that's across from me, right? The, the, the other tea maker. And, um, and so I got access to the tea and, and pff, I bought it, right? So now I'm drinking it for enjoyment. And the second, then, and the last one, right? This is number four. You got to have a thick skin. If you don't deal with uh, criticism very well, if you don't deal with attacks from people very well, uh, you might not want to put your name on your tea sourcing. I guess you can still tea source as long as you're in the background, right? But if you put your name on the teas that you source or you are highly, highly tied into the brand, and we'll get into that uh, with this in the second section, people are not going to like your tea and they're going to say bad things about it and they're going to say that your tea is crap and they're going to say that the... Uh, the, thankfully for me, I'm pretty good with my tasting notes. They don't say that my tasting notes are wrong. They just say that the tea is crap. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, right? And this is inevitable. Now, for me, it happens quite rarely. It's not something that happens every day. But I, I remember them all, right? You can take 100 good things someone says about you, and then what do you remember? You remember the bad thing, right? The one bad thing versus 100 good things. And... And the reviews for, for the teas at Mountain Stream Teas are usually about like that. <laughs> you know, they're usually about like that. And, uh, and so, so I remember all the bad ones, right? But thankfully, I've got a pretty thick skin, so it's okay for me to handle. If you can't handle that, be a little bit careful, a little bit wary in wandering too far into the tea sourcing biz. Uh, and again, attach, attaching your names to what you source because there will always be people who don't like your tea. And it's usually the more people who like your tea, then you'll get the really vicious, vindictive person who will go after the tea that has the most amount of good reviews. <laughs> it's just the way, just human nature and the way things work in the world. <clears throat> Anyways, let's go to the next part. Okay, I'll do it. Let's go. So you decided. You said, okay, I've taken account all the different things. Uh, that ball guy scared me a little bit, but you know what? I'm still going to do it. I'm still going to jump in. I'm still going to be a tea sorcerer. Well, now you got to start thinking about your market versus what you love. So there's number one, right? Are you going to say, okay, you know what? I think this is what the market is going to want. And then you search for that. You search for that taste point. You search for that. Or you search for what you love and the taste preferences that jump out at you and make you go, wow, I love this tea. Now, this ties into number two. Uh, well, I should have mentioned this before. You should have, hopefully you have your, uh, you've got it in maybe in another tab. But I've sent out, uh, given you guys basically a list of what I'm looking at right here so you can follow along as we go. But the power of passion is immeasurable. Immeasurable. Like right now, I absolutely love this tea. Right? I absolutely love it. Now, it's not exactly the uh, cleanest tea in the sense of it's not certified organic and I'm sure there is some uh, actually no I'm not too sure anyways it's very very clean on the palate but I'm not positive I haven't had it tested and, and I didn't see the garden now I have a strong emotional attachment attachment to this tea because of how I got it and I could sit here with passion describing the taste to you telling you that I don't actually I haven't actually stepped around the garden but this tea is spectacular and You'd be curious about it because I've got passion about this tea, right? This, this tea that, that, I mean, the tasting notes for this tea, it's a, it's a Alishan Fusho uh, cultivar, 1,400 meter tea. And it is a sort of uh, high mid range or high low, in between low and mid ranged uh, oxidized oolong. 
and it has butter and it has floral and it has fruit and it has just the right amount of bitterness in the street. Anyways, it's, it's in a beautiful tea. You know, even me talking about it, you can sort of feel the passion, right? Like, I can sell this tea. But if I'd gone to a warehouse somewhere and I just sat down and they'd given me 10 oolongs and I'm like, oh, I like this one. Uh, what's the story? I wouldn't have that same passion. All right, so I can be honest about this tea, talk about the tea, the taste profile, my experience with it, and sell this tea. And I'll be able to sell it much, much easier than I would the warehouse tea. Okay? So that's something you got to, to go back to number one. What's your market or what you love? And that's a big deal, right? When you're doing this, that's a big deal. Are you going to go with what you love or are you going to go with what you think people want? Are you going to market it as skinny teas, right? Because you think that's someone told you that that's what, what people want. Or are you going to go off and find brand new teas with a taste profile that you absolutely love, that you've had success with in the past, and then go with that as strongly as you can? Right? Obviously, I'm sort of in the later camp. But when you start narrowing in and deciding you're going to source tea, that's something you really, really, really have to think about. Truly. So number three, I... I alluded to this a little bit as we got started, but you sort of have to talk about private versus public sourcing. And what I mean by that is, if you're gonna source tea and you're gonna sell it, are you the brand? Are you no part of the brand? Are you a hybrid between the brand and, you know, are you half brand, half personality? Now, for, for me and Mountain Stream Teas, it's turned into something where I am mostly the brand. So the brand is intertwined in my personality because mostly my customers have come from, uh, from Instagram. And so my personality is heavily into the Instagram. Now I have to decide in the future what I'm gonna do with that. Am I gonna keep, the, keep it the same or am I gonna move it to something different? Am I going to be, you know, am I gonna make the Mountain Stream Tees brand bigger and diminish me, right? Or, or am I going to keep it the same way it is right now? I, I don't know. I haven't figured that out yet. But you have to know your personality. Are you able to be the upfront, the spokesperson, the person in the front? If not, then when you have to start thinking about that at the very, 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 very start, right? When you go and you're taking pictures of the tea gardens, if you're sourcing, you don't want to be in the pictures, right? Maybe you can put your hands in the pictures or whatever, but you don't want to be in the pictures. If you're interviewing farmers, you don't want to be in the frame, right? All of these things are very, very important. What are you actually doing in the sense of a brand, right? Or in the sense of personality, what is it going to be? And from the very start, you've got to have that figured out. Now, you don't have to have it figured out 100%. Obviously, there's the hybrid, there's a big gray zone. It's a, it's a spectrum, as they say. But have that in mind. If your personality is, I do not want to be a part of it, then make sure you stay out of it from the very start or else you'll be drawn in, which can be, if you're sort of a, a quiet person or a private person, can be a little bit tough for sure. Now, if you have questions about any of the stuff that's gone on so far, write them down. Uh, at the end of this, I've been told there will be a 15-minute sort of live session. So I will be around for that 15 minute live session to ask these questions. But if you have questions so far, remember, just write them down. We'll get to them at the end. Now, here's the part that you guys are actually here for. So I got on my soapbox and I told you all the philosophical points about whether or not you should do it or, or should not, trying to scare you off so I have less competition. Oh, ah, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm trying to save you guys some time and some effort and some love uh, that, that you can, you know, make the right choice if you actually want to do this or not. Where is the tea? So when I'm talking about tea, uh, we talked about my biases before, sort of in the hipster tea realm. We're also talking about my biases in the sense of Taiwanese teas. So I'm going to try and make this as broad as possible, but I'm also filtering this through the wonderful country that is Taiwan. And so things here are way easier than they are in most other countries. Because Taiwan is a small country, it's a safe country, the roads are great, the people are great, generally speaking. And, you know, you can, you can drive from one tea mountain to the other tea mountain in a couple of hours. 
not a couple days like it would be, say, in China or uh, in India or even in Japan, right? So, so keep that in mind as I'm talking about this stuff, but I'll try and make it as broad as I possibly can. So, where is the tea? In the country that you go to, okay, where is the tea? Number one, research, 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 and then research more. Now, what I mean by that is every single area that you visit, you should have at least, at least five or six very, very, very good leads before you even go. At least five or six, right? At least five or six. Because you never know what's going to happen. And chances are you're coming from a different country, say to Taiwan, for example. <laughs> it's because the only one I got, <laughs> for examples. But when you go to this area, you know, the, the tea growing region, there's going to be a lot of things. So do your research as much as you possibly, possibly can. Right? You do not want to get stuck. And every once in a while, I'll see these videos, these tea sourcing videos. Um, I won't tell too detailed, but it was the point is, is that they'll, they'll go somewhere and... And they'll only have one person. And then, and then something will fall through. And then they're like, and now we don't know what to do. And I sort of go, did you not do your research? <laughs> you know, like, like th there should be four or five other people who are at least on the internet say they're doing the same thing. Now, I know that's really tough. There's language issues. There's all these different types of things going on. But if you want to be a successful tea sourcer, you've got to overcome that stuff. Right? There's Google Translate. Uh, if you're after a certain type of tea, you know, you just got to Google Translate it and run with it and see what you can find. But you got to research. You cannot be stuck with just a couple places to go or just one place. You will have a bad time. You will have a bad time if you do that. Um, yeah, you should plan A to F and then still be flexible. So if you see a garden that you like that, that hits all your, again, for me, it'd be the, the hipster check marks, organic. I'd be like, whose garden is that? Still be flexible to be able to go and see who, who does that tea. Number two is the most important thing. So in the future, if this winds up on YouTube, then just send people to this exact moment. If you want to be an, a successful and effective tea sourcer, the most important thing is to get with tea farmer families. Build relationships. You build accountability, consistency, reputation, and relationships. You find a tea farmer family. I, I do this all the time in my sourcing. I find a, a family that, that I respect, that, that respects me, that I enjoy their tea, that I walk around the gardens, I know they're doing a good job. And then I sample all the teas. I mean, remember that, that, that these types of places, they're not doing just one type of tea. They're doing a black tea and a green tea and an oolong tea and a white tea, doing all sorts of different types of teas. And you can go in and sample all the different types of teas, again, in the Taiwanese context. <laughs> I know in other places they don't. Uh, but anyways, in the Taiwanese context, you can sample the teas and you can buy like four or five of them. Right? And you might only buy a little bit of four or five of them, but you get the bulk discount. You get a discount because you bought in bulk. And if you want more, then you don't have to worry about phoning five or six different people, right? Or I'll get into this in a minute, the warehouse problem. But phoning back the warehouse and saying, I want the same tea. And they'll be like, yeah, well, what was the same tea? What number was it? Right? We can't, we can't do that. Right? And if you get to know them well, you can say, I want this same sort of taste. And you can, you know, anyways, it's much, much, much better to find a farmer family, even if it's harder even if the cost is more expensive, then over the years you can build up a relationship and you can have consistency with those farmer families and you can save yourself a lot of trouble, right? You can save yourself a lot of trouble. Now, the number three one, city versus countryside versus time. This is a good rule that I always use. You know, the more beautiful the sampling setting, the more expensive the tea is and the more money you lose on the buying side. So, you go to Taipei, right? 
again, using Taiwan, I'm sorry, but that's all I've got, right? So you go to Taipei and you go and you go to a very expensive tea house and you go and you sit down and you say, oh, can I buy some of this tea? And then they, you know, they explain it to you and then you're losing a lot of money on the buy side. The cheapest teas you'll ever find are in uh, small, out of the way farmers' huts. All right, in Taiwan, it doesn't really get. Uh, Taiwan's got the lowest poverty rate in the world, so it's it's not really that poverty stricken. But you're on a farmer's place. There's going to be a table out. You know, there's going to be maybe some cigarette butts over here. Uh, you know, maybe some betel nut over there. There's going to be some beautiful tea in the middle, but it is not going to be a beautiful setting, right? They're going to pour tea into a bowl and the bowl is going to overflow with water. And then, you know, you're just going to have to sit there and look at each other and hopefully, you know, talk a little bit. And then you take some spoons and then you try out the tea. That's where you get the best prices. So what's your time though? Finding those places, getting those places is hard. So it's on the spectrum, right? One side is you just go to the tea district of whichever town you're in. You walk around through that market. You sit down. You sample 100 different teas. You say, that's the one I like. You buy it. You bring it back. But you don't know the garden. You don't know the farmer. You don't have the passion, the real passion in selling that tea. It's hard for you to sell it because you don't have that passion, right? Then the other side is you go up into the mountains and you walk around for weeks and you try and find the best farmer family with the, with the philosophy that's closest to yours and you stomp around their tea garden and hopefully they're producing tea and you help them produce the tea and then you buy it there and you have extreme amounts of passion and knowledge about that tea. I'm not the one who's going to tell you what's best for you. But I will say, if the only thing you do is the warehouse, right, in the city, you're going to have a bad time. It's going to be very, 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 very hard for you. Because everybody can go to a warehouse. How many people can actually go into the mountains? So that's really what you have to do. You have to decide how much time you're going to spend and how you're going to do it. Right? Because that's... It's a, it's a real big deal, right? And don't buy tea from one of those beautiful places. Just don't. I mean, I don't know if, you, uh, if you've ever been to Taiwan again. Taiwan is examples. I apologize. But there's this Shanlin Shi area. I don't have tea from Shanlin Shi on my website because I can't find anybody I trust. And when you drive up to the Shanlin Shi, Shanlin Shi area, on either side are these beautiful tea houses with a bunch of tea from Vietnam. <laughs> and let's face it, there's just tea from Vietnam. And, and it's all piled up in beautiful foil-wrapped pyramids, and there's boxes, and there's dragons everywhere. I mean, if you buy your tea from someplace like that, you're losing a lot of money on the buy side. And chances are, the tea is just going to be crap. Chances are it is. Even if it tastes good, you know, there's all the tricks where, you know, the tea that you buy and the, the tea that you take home or, or the tea that you sample and the tea that you take home are different because even though they look like they're in the same packages and blah, 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 blah. But the point is, don't buy tea from those places, right? When I'm starting the spectrum here, I'm starting at a warehouse, <laughs> right? <laughs> not, in, not in a showroom. And then, and then over here is the farm, right? So find wherever your specific and best spot is. Somewhere in the middle there. Then number four, know your stuff. That is the only way to get a good price for anything. And that's very much the truth. And if you really want to get a good price for tea, the only way you can get a good price for tea is if you know just as much, if not more, than the farmer. That's the only way you can get the best price. And only then, after a very long period of time, all right, once you get, build up a relationship and once you have that, right, that, that personal touch, that personal aspect of having the teas, right, and knowing the teas and really, really knowing the teas. That's, and that takes time. I mean, that takes time. Uh, how best to do that? I do not know. Everybody's different. I won't claim that I know exactly the best way to do something like that. Uh, my own story is I just 
I fell in love with it about five or six years ago. I uh, ran another company called, uh, well, I still run it, although there's no tourists, uh, Hualien Outdoors. And so I take people into the mountains and rivers of Hualien for adventure tours, the town where I live, on the east coast of Taiwan. And then I fell in love with, with this type of tea. So I, I designed a trip where I took people to uh, a tea garden that I really enjoyed and I really connected with, about an hour's drive south of where I live. And so I spent two or three times a month there, first being the translator, then being the educator, teaching them about the tea. And I did that for about a year and a half and learned so much about what people wanted, about the, their ideas of tea. But I wasn't sampling a lot of teas, right? I was just at that one place. But after that, I was like, okay, I've got enough confidence now that I can go and I can start. Made lots of mistakes, but that's what got me started. So how can you start? I don't know. You know, I want the best Alishan Oolong. So I'm going to go on the internet and buy 10 grams of every single Alishan Oolong everywhere. And then, and then the one person that has, uh, the, one person that has the, the best one that I thought was the best Alishan Oolong, I will go and ask them all the questions I possibly can about where they found it and, and all these types of things. I don't know. But you have to know your stuff. You can't expect to show up and just be nice and find good tea and get a good price for that good tea. You can't. You have to know your stuff. And it's a process and takes a long time, of course. And a big part of that is the next section. How to act around tea farmers or how to talk to tea farmers. Again, again, the asterisk is Taiwan. And you know, so that's the asterisk, right? It's Taiwan and uh, they're organic farmers, right? So uh, this is my experience, right? Take it for what it's worth. But one of the most important things, uh, and I just steeped this for a very long time, but that's okay because this tea is beautiful and very flexible. Um, number one is be humble but firm. Don't walk into a place and act like you know what they're producing or how they're producing it or anything like that. You have to be asking questions and you say, I'd like to sample some tea and you'll see what comes out. And then you very politely give your uh, examples of the teas. You would never say this tea is bad. Remember, when you're going to visit a tea farmer for the first time, they're going to give you a good one and a bad one. And they're going to see your reaction. If you say, oh, this bad one is really good, they're going to be like, oh, okay, whatever. Here, yes, yeah, this tea is, you know, this price and da 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 da. If you if you don't mention the bad one and start asking questions about the good one, then they'll be like, oh, hey, there's a real person here. Let's actually start talking, All right? But if you walk in and say, this one's bad, this one's good, I want more good. You're gonna have a bad time, All right? You're just gonna have a bad time, All right? You're not gonna be able to get more tea. Right, this is a slow process. It's a very, very, very slow process. You also, I mean, one of my pet peeves and one of the things I have to always worry about is that most places now have some Ruby 18. To give you an example of what I'm talking about. And the Ruby 18 is a very common cultivar now planted all over the place. And I will hear farmers say, but my Ruby 18 is different than the other people's Ruby 18. And every time I hear that, I go, oh, no, I wanted to like you. <laughs> but I have to eat that, right? I have to say, oh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've got enough Ruby 18. I don't need to buy any more Ruby 18. Um, but I have to keep it humble. I can't say, oh, everybody says that. Don't say that, right? Got to keep it humble, right? Got to keep it humble. Uh, part of that as well is, is don't bring in other tea, but mention it near the end. So what that means is when you come in, don't take another batch of tea to sample side by side. you got to have that taste memory down. If you're looking for a bunch of Dongding Oolongs, you can't be bringing in four other places Dongding Oolongs and drinking them side by side with the person who's giving you tea. They don't like it, and it's rude. Right? What if the other tea is way better than, your, than, the, than the tea that they're offering and you stand up and leave? I mean, that's just, that's just rude. Right? But the best tea people always, always want to sample other people's teas. 
They always do. They might not want to right away, but the more they know you, the more they want to sample other people's tea. So at the end, you might say, oh, I've got some tea from, from other places. I don't know if you want to try it or something like that. It'll be like, ah, don't worry about it. Or which places, right? Something like that. Um, but that's usually after you've known the, the tea producers for a very long time. But still, a lot of producers, and it's one of my red flags, if they don't want to drink anybody else's tea ever, red flag for me, right? It's actually a pretty big red flag because that means they don't have confidence in their own tea being the best. The best producers and the best people that, that I spend time with, the people that I'm closest with, whenever I show up, they're like, what tea did you bring? And I've got all sorts of crazy teas from all sorts of different places, right? And it's, we drink it together and we talk about them and it's, it's wonderful. Um, but I got to have a thick skin, right? Because they're going to be like, this tea is crap. This tea is da 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 But I'm the one who sourced that tea, right? So, so again, it's, it's all of these things, all these things that I'm tying in together. You know, you have to keep them in mind, right? Even at that level with, with the other people and you're sourcing tea, if they say it's bad tea, it's going to hurt you. Uh, number three, to buy or not to buy a little tea basically boils down to at the end when they say, would you like to buy some tea? The yes or no, well, you can be super, super, super nice and say, yes, I'll buy a little bit. Usually that's what I do. I'll buy maybe if their tea is terrible, I'll buy maybe their cheapest tea, a little bit of it. But generally speaking, I, at this point in the game, I know pretty early on who I'm going to work with. And if I'm going to work with somebody, then I'll buy their tea. If I want to keep the door open, I'll buy their tea. I'll buy some of it. Uh, like for example, this tea right here, I didn't even ask the price. Again, story is, was the last tea he offered me and he said, this is the tea that I like and this is an amazing tea. It's a spectacular tea. It really is. It's one of the best Ali Shan Oolongs I've ever had. It is amazing. And I said, okay, I want some of this, but I didn't ask a price. Right? Because it was our first interaction and I'm buying it. I'm just buying this tea. It was our first interaction. All right? So... Hmm. It's, it's a great, oh. so what it boils down to is you want to still keep a relationship with these people. If all the teas are terrible, don't worry about it. You don't have to buy, right? If you think you want to keep the door open, it's best to buy a little bit of tea, right? Just buy a little bit, right? But chances are if the teas are really bad, they're cheap anyway, so you can buy some as well. But don't feel like you really, really have to. It's not really a part of the culture here to buy a little bit of tea every time you go somewhere. Not at all. But if you respect the person and you want to keep the door open, then do it. I'm repeating myself. Let's get to the last little bits of examples here. Now, sorry here, I'm going to see how much time I've got left. So I've got seven minutes left. Okay. And then we'll open it up to questions. So, If you're going to be a tea sourcer and you want to be successful, the most important thing, the question you have to ask yourself is, are you going to stand by your tea? If you want to be successful, you got to stand by your tea. You got to take that tea. Now, again, I'm, when you're talking about the brand versus the personality thing, okay, but you're going to be accessible to somebody. If you're going to go out and you're going to get tea, you're going to be accessible to somebody. Maybe it's the owner of the brand. Right? Or maybe it's the, the customers or maybe whoever. But you have to, if you're taking responsibility for sourcing that tea, you have to stand by your tea. Right? If you don't stand by your tea, you're going to have a bad time. Right? You are. You're going to have a bad time. All right? If somebody says, you know, this tea is no good, and then you say, well, you know, you wanted a tea for $10 a kilogram. Ugh. Why are you buying a tea for $10 a kilogram anyways? <laughs> you know, that's, that's my perspective on it, right? Um, uh, so, so, so as you're doing this, you've got to be very careful, right? Uh, you know, we're talking at a, at a tea festival, so chances are you guys are drinking higher quality teas, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, you know, you've got to be very, very careful that you stand by your teas, right? that you have accountability for them, and you will be successful 
Because, number two, you will make mistakes. Own them. How you react makes your career. How you react makes your career. You will make mistakes. When you're sourcing tea, you might think that a tea is this. It's really not. And you make the mistake when you're first starting out. Everybody knows this. Right? Like everybody knows. I remember when I was first starting out, an example. I had a tea, just like the first six months I was online and I found this guy and I, the tea was very nice. It was poor tea. And he said it, there was 500-year-old trees and I marketed it as 500-year-old trees. And, and it, was, it was just basically what it boiled out being was just boiled out to be boiled down to, turned out being anyways, was a, an extremely entry-level, decent quality Ai Lao Shan poor. And somebody called me on it and I went, oh, well, and I started doing the research and looking at it, which I should have done beforehand. But again, you can't be everything. You can't do everything. And it turned out that my price was exactly the same for the, basically the exact same tea. There was a, there was a good customer of mine who had bought the Crimson Lotus version and my version, put them side by side and said they tasted identical. It was the exact same price as the Crimson Lotus one that was marketed as the introductory Ai Lao Shan, Ai Lai, uh, Ai, Ai Lai, Ai Lai, uh, Ai Lao Shan, Ai Lao Shan poor. And I went, whoo, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I admitted my mistake and I'm like, sorry about that, but nobody lost any money and nobody got lied to. At least the person that I bought the tea from was honest in that respect, right? Exact same price. Right? And I got lucky. Right? by making that mistake. After that, I was like, okay, if I'm not going to the garden, I'm not buying the tea. Right? And now at this level, I've been doing this for a long time now, I can sort of, when it comes to Taiwanese teas, I can not go to the garden. I can meet the person, see the, the setup, and, and be okay. But when I first started out, no way. <laughs> right? No way. I had to stomp around the garden right? <laughs> and see them make it to trust it. But, you know, you will make mistakes. Number three, start small, make small mistakes. You find a tea you like, buy some of it, sell your heart out, see if people like it. Maybe nobody likes it. Maybe the tasting notes that you came up with it were completely wrong for everybody else, right? But start small, make small mistakes, okay? That's a really, really good one. A good one for basically everything. Um, tea sourcing is not glamorous. It's hard work, stressful misunderstandings are ripe and it's high stakes gambling as you get further into it. But it's extremely fulfilling if you get it right. Now, one of my pet peeves is the Instagram photos, you know, where there's usually a woman, but sometimes a man who, who has their back turned to the camera and a shoulder is showing. And, They've got the things like this and they're staring at the mountains. Like, look at me, I'm a tea sourcer. It's not the way it works. <laughs> That's not how you source tea. <laughs> That's how you, you get very expensive tea and then you go into the mountains around Taipei and Pingling and then you go and find four or five different uh, tea gardens by driving around the mountains a little bit and take pictures there. That's what that is, right? And you might be able to sell your first batch of tea but you're never gonna be able to buy those teas again. You buy in a warehouse, you're never gonna be able to buy, find the same teas again, the same quality of teas for the same price point. You're gonna to have to go to that garden again. You won't be able to do it from another place. And tea sourcing is really, 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 really hard work and it is not glamorous. It really isn't. Like, don't go into tea sourcing expecting you're going to travel the world and find all these tea gardens and, you know, commune with nature and all these things. No, no. You're going to go and you're going to work your ass off and you're going to be disappointed and you're going to be tired. But if you work really hard and you find those really beautiful teas and you share them with people, When, when I read a review and somebody feels the same way about a tea that I do, 
there's a certain validation that comes with that, a certain powerful validation in the back end of that, that really makes me happy, right? It's this, it's very, very fulfilling. And especially if it's agrochemical free and organic and all, the, all that stuff over there as well, right? <laughs> I won't lie to you. I mean, that's, that's a huge part of what I do as well, uh, is that. But we've reached the 45 minute mark. And now we're going to open it up to questions. So if you have any questions, please stick around and I'd be happy to answer them for you. Thanks for watching. So hi, Matt. Uh, thank you for being here with us today in Nomad Festival Europe. It's a pleasure to have you here and your presentation was fantastic. Actually, I'm going to take some of your tips on for my my own business as well. So, yeah. Um, well, thank you. thanks for giving me the opportunity and I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's um, I sort of stumbled into tea sourcing, right? It wasn't I wasn't uh, it wasn't a career choice that I had a goal for many, many years. Uh, but once I recognized what it was, I definitely jumped in and, and worked really hard at it. And it's so much fun. It really is. It's, it really is. It's so much fun. Was it hard uh, to start at the beginning? Because, well, my experience is that when they don't know you, I mean, my, my experience is with Japan, but I believe in China might be exactly the same. If they don't know you, then they don't trust you. So <laughs> it's well, I'm, I'm, Yes, and I'm a firm believer in sort of the holographic nature of the universe. And, and what I mean by that is, think about if you're doing anything right the first time you start a job the first time you meet someone new it's, it's always the same thing it's always the same steps and there are shortcuts right there are shortcuts in the sense that if you are really 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 good at tea right and and they they you know the the, the classic thing is you know a tea farmer will lay a bunch of teas in front of you mm -hmm. and uh and and you'll sample a couple of teas and then you, if you can dive into the good one and be like ask about the processing ask about this and that and the other thing and bring in some you know some some ideas about what that tea is about then you can just go to the next level right you can skip all of that stuff and it's sort of like oh, okay let's start and that's really the hardest part that really really is the hardest part is, okay, is being able to know the teas well yep. enough yeah, right. because sometimes you, if you don't know, you buy absolutely rubbish tea and then you're selling it thinking you are selling good tea. But in the end, if you don't know your teas, it's difficult that you can't sell them not like with confidence, right? And the best farmers won't sell you their tea. Yeah. Or they'll sell you their bad tea, right? <laughs> they they'll just sell you the stuff in the back. Now, I just sell you the stuff in the back. You know, <laughs> That's true. Um, so we have some questions um, mm -hmm. and uh, this is from Newton in Vancouver and he's asking if there is a general rule of markup on good teas. Uh, so this is a challenge uh, for Western facing vendors the world over. Uh, right now I'm actually trying to deal with it. Uh, I've got a, um, a dollar a gram tea that I am getting into stock again in the next couple of days. And it's the first dollar gram tea that I've ever bought. It's a fresh tea. It's a it's a Eastern beauty, Oriental beauty, um, high elevation, blah, blah, blah. I don't need to get into the details. The point is, I haven't been getting the very, very expensive teas because there is not a market for them. You know, for $30 for 100 grams of tea, people are like, oh, my God, that's so expensive. Wow. To even start. Right. So if you're saying, you know, $30 for 30 grams of tea, they're just, they're just going to be like, they're going to walk away. And that's, that's really where we are in the Western world. So what's the good markup? The teas that, that I get, uh, if they were sold in Taiwan or they were sold by people who are using sort of that type of pricing, um, generally speaking, would be about double the price of what I charge for them. And I do that now because my costs are very low in the sense that I live in Taiwan. Uh, mm -hmm. I get these things shipped to me. It's very, very easy for me to to get the teas. But also, I also want to educate people. Yeah, right? I want to get the teas out. So it's a very, very tough question because 
Well, if you can if you can buy a dollar a gram tea that's worth a dollar a gram and sell it for five dollars a gram, I don't see anything wrong with that, right? But I do see a problem with you buy a ten cent a gram tea, sell it for three dollars a gram. That's not good, right? Because yeah. you're setting up mm -hmm. you're setting up a really bad situation for yourself and the consumers in the future. Yeah, um, because people they're going to understand pretty soon. Like it's moving it's quickly. Yeah. It's very also, good. also, I was uh, sorry. Uh, I was saying that when you are at the source, I think uh, you can obviously offer better prices than if you have to import and you are in another place. Because, for example, if you import anything to Europe, you have to add the VAT all the time. Which actually, I mean, you know. But not only that, there are other costs involved. So in the end, it makes it more expensive. So you can be as competitive uh, than if a person who who is in the source. And on that note, actually, we have another question that says, um, in your experience or opinion, would it be possible to do tea sourcing if you are not in the same location as the tea farmers? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, now, what that would take, however, would be ex extremely well-crafted emails. <laughs> and that would mean uh, you would have to have uh, the most charismatic emails and uh, do things like get their address and then send them a present. You know, like, <laughs> and then if you send them a present unasked, then they'd be like, well, Damn, you know, they sent us the present. I guess we're going to have to send them some tea samples, right? <laughs> um, so you would have to you'd have to set it up and think about it really, really, really hard. Obviously, right now, in today's climate, that's a real issue. And uh, we're getting to the point in Taiwan again. All of these things I'm talking about in Taiwan because I know that mm -hmm. um, very, very. That's that's you know I'm not going to other countries right now as well. Yeah, but there's starting to be the decline in demand and the the up that the supplies has stayed the same but the decline in demand has started and mm -hmm. so there are a lot more farmers who would be much more interested mm -hmm. in in answering and sending out well craft like if you send a well crafted email in sending out something like that um to be able to to start that process of you know starting that relationship it's possible. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. And what tea do you? Uh, we have another question. It says what tea do you sell? I believe it's how many teas or what kind of teas do you sell? Because I think you sell more than one. Yes. Uh, my website is mountainstreamteas.com. Uh, I'm pretty active on Instagram, and uh, you could visit the website and see. I mean, right now I don't know. There's forty or fifty teas that are mm -hmm. on, online, everything from sort of the Hakka style preserved tea balls to uh, high mountain oolongs to, um, yeah. anyways, there's lots of tea, uh, but yeah. it's, it's Taiwanese and agrochemical free. And I believe it takes time because at the beginning, at least by my experience, you get like one, two, three, then four, then maybe 10, then they, you start building up and then you get a bigger prof portfolio, right? And it takes time to just find the things that you want to sell because you don't want to sell everything. At least I don't want to sell everything. If it doesn't pass the quality mark I have, I don't sell it. So... Yes, yeah, and I it, think it's it, the same. it takes a while to, to, you know, like I said in the talk, like start small. Mm. Get 500, 600 grams of tea to start. There's no reason no. to get more. You know, no. there's no reason to get more, and then and then build up from there. Yeah. Um, okay, that's good. And then um, Rita is asking, what can you advise if you don't speak the local language but you want to source tea? Um, and that's that's a tough one. So my my real. Uh, advantage for what I'm doing is I've lived in Taiwan for 15 years and I speak Mandarin fluently. So mm, okay. I can just show up in a garden and be like, hey, how's it going? Let's sit down. Let's, let's they throw the tea at you. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, it is absolutely possible if you have a trusted uh, person sort of to travel with you, a mm -hmm. uh, trusted partner or something like that. But with all partnerships, yeah. it's tough, right? It's, it's obviously it's tough. Um, that being said, there are still a lot of people who speak English, right? I mean, we're speaking English now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I've got that, you know, the, the uh, 
you know, everybody's speaking my mother tongue. Yay, you know, but it's the truth, right? It's like yeah. you can go to countries and there, there are still, it's not a small amount. There are still a lot of people that speak English. And uh, especially, for example, in Taiwan, uh, the younger generation that is taking over. So people between uh, anybody less than 40, basically, eh, 45, anybody less than 45. They're taking over for their from their father or the grandfather's generation, and they can all speak English quite fine, right? Okay. And if not fluently, they can speak it okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is it's definitely possible. Don't don't just give up because you don't know the language. Uh, and, so, know. and sometimes there are people who are actually doing tea travel tourism, which actually have a lot of networking, and then mm -hmm. they can take you to the source as well like you so yeah you can also hire the services if uh, i mean it costs you money but in the end saves you time so it's up to you you know what you want to save money or time <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Was, uh, uh, it's, the website's live but it's called mountain stream tea tours <laughs> so that was what i was going to launch this year um but that that didn't turn out um but that was that was the idea i was actually going to uh, take people around to actually meet the farmers and okay um because what i do is you know i go out and i can only buy so much tea and uh but there's a lot of people creating if they're doing organic agricultural if they have an agricultural or sorry an agrochemical free tea project i want to support them yeah right? i want to get them yeah. to be successful so the idea was to take people around all these places so they could actually buy tea from the farmers yeah. and take the pictures and do all that sort of stuff um, I agree. But, uh, okay yeah. so yeah. we don't have more time sorry about that um there are more questions maybe you want to reply them in the chat and and leave them your details so they can like contact you and uh, yeah they can ask you more questions if they want so thank you very much everybody it has been a really nice um chat with matt it was really great to meet you today uh and uh, we are gonna do the next uh talk in a couple of minutes with ian chun from you know me bye everybody <laughs>